it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Harjun Chang uh, to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I'm delighted they've agreed to do this interview for our school here. Oh, my pleasure. I have four quick questions to ask you, and we won't detain you too much. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, my, my first question is, you know, your, about your new book, yep. Economics, the User's Guide. It will be released on May 1st, right. very soon. Can you give us a sense of what this new book is about? And yes, what, um, what is the big message you're trying to convey? Well, the, the book is, uh, first of all, the coming out as actually the first volume in the revived Pelican series of paperback from Penguin Press. The Pe Pelican paperback existed between the 1930s and the 1980s, introducing the general readership to all sorts of subjects from the universe to ants to bird watching wow. to philosophy. <laughs> Basically, it's uh, trying to introduce the general readership uh, to economics without assuming any knowledge. So the basicalists are trying to tell people how the, the economics is uh, defined and how the numbers in economics are put together, how different concepts are defined. But the reality is that, uh, you know, these days, uh, you know, despite this impression that economics is a number subject, even people with a uh, degree in economics uh, do not know how big the world economy is, what proportion of that is uh, produced by China yes. or the United States and you know <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to yeah, give uh, the, my reader the, uh, some sense of uh, reality. Yeah? Since you mentioned China, I was going to say that uh, the former Prime Minister of Australia, who also speaks Mandarin by the way, oh, yeah, the Mr. Uh, Rudd, yeah. Kevin Rudd, came and spoke at our mm. school a few minutes ago mm. and also gave an interview like this. Right. And he was saying that China is now undertaking a major change in economics direction, mm. in a sense, to put it crudely, to shift from an export-oriented yeah. focus mm -hmm. to a domestic yeah. demand focus. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, China's consumption as a share of its GNP is very small, as you know. And if they can raise it, it can yeah. generate a lot of internal demand. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think, how successful do you think President Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang can be? Uh, China has uh, massive imbalances between different regions, different classes, between consumption and investment, between the domestic economy and the external economy. To you know, to give you an example to put uh, to put uh, this thing into perspective, you know, any kind of continental-sized economy, be it Brazil, Japan, or the United States. International trade uh, account for only about 15% uh, in their national output. In the case of China, it's uh, nearly 30%. So for its size, it's very dependent on external demand. So we are talking about the huge uh, the, the challenges. Now, these imbalances, uh, at least in part, were inevitable if you're going to generate that kind of huge uh, the growth. But now, they've reached a stage where unless they correct these imbalances, the whole thing might that, uh, collapse in the sense that, uh, you know, that uh, you can't suppress uh, consumption forever, you know, that there is uh, such a thing as uh, too much investment, you know, the excessive reliance on the external economy that makes you vulnerable, and these uh, regional and the uh, uh, class uh, disparities are creating huge uh, the internal uh, problems, you know, I mean, unbeknownst to the outside world, China experiences hun uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, industrial strikes and local riots and demonstrations every year. So the, the Chinese leadership is uh, the fully aware of uh, these uh, problems. Now the question is whether they can make changes quickly enough uh, to address all these problems so because in, in, before it uh, all uh, tumbles down. In one word, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, I'm reserving my judgment at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, because uh, uh, they started uh, working on this only in the last uh, few years. Yes, yes, yes. And these are such massive challenges that uh, they right. take uh, at least several years, possibly a couple of decades uh, to correct. Yes, and it's uh, yes. uh, too early to tell, you know, the Chou Lai, the Mao Zedong's uh, number two man once famously uh, said uh, that it's uh, too early to tell when he was asked to comment on, on the, the yeah that's right <laughs> consequences of uh, French Revolution. So in that uh, spirit, I'm reserving my judgment. Now let me turn to another country from the largest, one of the largest countries in the world, or the largest country in the world, China, to one of the smallest countries in the yeah. world, Singapore. And I know you've studied Singapore, so what what do you think are the lessons 
that other countries can draw from Singapore's yeah. economic development? Well, I would uh, say two things. Uh, one is uh, the importance of developing your own national capabilities in terms of uh, technology and management and so on. Because, uh, you know, a lot of uh, countries, sometimes inspired by Singapore's success, uh, uh, indeed, uh, have tried to invite uh, multinational companies, but very few have uh, succeeded in the way that uh, Singapore has. And in my view, the difference is that Singapore, uh, while inviting uh, foreign companies to get access to technology marketing and management skills, made it sure that uh, there are matching local capabilities. Yeah? So you produce high quality engineers tailored to the particular industries that you are trying to promote. You provide uh, custom made uh, the infrastructure, you uh, make sure that there are skilled workers and so on. And that's what really made uh, the difference between Singapore. You know, I mean, there are countries like Sri Lanka who have been quoting foreign investment for the last six years and uh, got uh, not even half uh, the, as much as uh, the uh, Singapore did uh, the out of doors, and that is uh, what really made the difference. But uh, another important lesson about Singapore is that it has been the epitome of uh, pragmatism. Eh? Because uh, Singapore yes. you know, combines uh, extreme features of uh, free market capitalism and socialism. Eh? That's right. So on the one hand, uh, you have uh, free trade and you have a uh, welcoming attitude yeah. towards foreign investors, but almost all the land is owned by the government. Yeah. You know, 85% of housing is uh, provided by the uh, housing board and, you know, the more than 20% of GDP is uh, produced by either the, the, the government boards or the uh, government-linked uh, enterprises. Yes. And I often uh, put it to my students, look, uh, give me one economic theory, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, neoclassical, Keynesian or Marxist, give me one economic theory that can explain Singapore and there isn't one. Yeah? So uh, it's an ultimate example of how important it is to be pragmatic, uh, how important uh, it is to be open-minded about your approach because uh, many countries have failed because they were fixated on an ideology. So final question, talking about the students at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, as they, if any of them watching this interview with you on our website uh, were to ask you this question, what is the most important mm -hmm. aspects of economic or economic development that they should learn while they're at a school of public policy. And do you have any specific advice for these potential students about the value of public policy education? I mean, at the individual level, we need division of labor. So we need uh, people who will work on very abstract problems, you know, cut off from the real world and so on. But in the end, why are we studying economics or the, the management sciences or politics or international relations, we are doing those in order to make our world better and therefore that in the end everything will have to be focused on public policy because of course I mean individuals are important but uh, you know in the end uh, the, you know, the government is the most important organization of technology that the humanity has uh, invented and uh, so many things are kind of uh, complex and uh, difficult enough that you need the government to do. And for that uh, purpose, uh, I think uh, the students uh, need to be practically minded in the end. You know, individually, you might be doing some fairly abstract uh, discipline, but in the end, you have to think about the implications of your theory for public policy and for social action. Because uh, in the end, that, uh, why are we studying all these things uh, to make our society better? But you've exactly reinforced the key mission of our school. You've said the mission of our school yeah. is to improve governance in Asia. And you've just reinforced the message when you study all these things. It is for a purpose. It is for to help people to do something mm -hmm. good for the world. So with that, let me thank you very much, uh, for your, you. the, uh, Arjun, for this interview. We deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.